discussion on education and its purpose and meaning and its place in a free republic. And we are here with the great Secretary of Education, Elizabeth DeVos, a wonderful person. Thank you for coming, Secretary. Pleasure to be here. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dr. Arn. And uh, if you kids can remember your names, perhaps you would introduce yourselves. <laughs> uh, I'm Jonah Apel. Uh, I graduated from a BCSI school last year, and I am going to major in politics here at Hillsdale. He's a freshman. Mm -hmm. I'm Natasha DiVirgilio. I'm a senior here studying politics. I also graduated from a BCSI school, uh, the same one as Jonah. <laughs> My name is Kathleen O'Toole. I'm the assistant provost for K-12 education here at Hillsdale College. That means I oversee the BCSI, the Barney Charter School Initiative, and Hillsdale Academy. I uh, started the school that these two brilliant kiddos went to. <laughs> Mr. Whitey. Well, uh, I'm Ben Whitey. I'm a senior here studying biochemistry, and I am uh, part of the classical education minor. I'm Grace Shanley. I'm a senior studying English and also a classical education minor. I plan on teaching next year. Yeah, Dan. Uh, yeah I'm Dan Copeland, and uh, I'm a professor of education, and. Um, I'm the chairman of the education department here at Hillsdale College. Uh, I teach courses um, on English grammar and uh, classic children's literature, and uh, these two are, are, are my students. I'm David Whalen, associate vice president for curriculum and a professor of English. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to ask some questions. And uh, I may direct them to somebody, and I may not, but uh, all of you feel free to pipe in when you want to. Um, uh, I'll direct the first one to Dan. What do we mean by classical education? Well, um, it's a term that's thrown around, and if you, if you Google it online, you will see, uh, I mean, a wide variety of uh, definitions um, but typically, most of the definitions that have to do with classical education include at least two elements, and that's wisdom and virtue, um, which are critically important because it speaks to the idea that it's not just about you know, filling students' heads with, with facts. Um, it's about uh, helping to instill knowledge and ultimately wisdom in an understanding of the world in a wide variety of, of uh, capacities. And so knowing things is important in the field, uh, in any field, in history, literature, in the sciences, in the mathematics. We need to know things, and schools should be about that. It should be about communicating things. So wisdom, the cultivation of wisdom. But classical education does not just leave, it, leave education with the head. Um, it's also concerned with the heart as well. And classical education is about the cultivation of virtue, of character, of morality. And it's not just about helping to, to cultivate smart human beings. Um, they're not truly human beings if their character has not, been, has not been cultivated. They're not fully human until they have both the wisdom and the virtue. What makes classical education special is that it's grounded in a tradition, a long-standing tradition. What classical education is not, it's not a fad. It's not something new that suddenly all these schools are opening up um, with the next new technique in the field of education. It's old. I mean, it's thousands of years old. So, you know, those of us who are involved in classical education are trying to tap into a tradition um, and we're trying um, to promote that, bring it back, uh, because we think that the cultivation of wisdom and virtue is worthwhile. Thank you. Uh, Natasha, what is wisdom? Wisdom is, with the Aristotelian definition, it's an intellectual virtue, and it's the highest one. Um, and the kind of short way that we like to phrase it is it's 
you know you have wisdom when you have knowledge of the things that don't change, the permanent things? Ooh. Not bad, is she? Uh, <laughs> Secretary DeVos, you may speak up or ask a question whenever you please, of course. Um, uh, Mr. Apel, why, why is education important in a Republican form of government, and what is that form? Well, if you're asking what is the Republican form of government, I think first and foremost it involves both a, a rule of the people and self-governance. So whenever, there's, whenever you govern yourself, right, it requires that virtue that uh, Dr. Copeland's been talking about. Um, you, have to, you have to understand both like, what, what really matters, and you have to be cultivated into a, a habit of doing those things. Because in self-government, the you know, cornerstone of a republic involves action, not just like, understanding. And so in the Aristotelian conception, you have to habituate yourself towards virtue. And so that's kind of the first and foremost step of education in a republic. And then I guess the other thing is that the republic, it's not, you know, be, there is self-government involved in it, but it's not simply a rule of the majority. You then have to say, okay, well, how can the majority of the people rule towards the common good of everyone? Because Aristotle and then the founders later, who you know, inform our American form of government, they're worried about you know, the rule of the majority. Because if those people haven't been cultivated by education to wisdom and virtue, then they might um, pass laws and things like that that bring harm to their own citizens. And so I think ultimately there, um, you have to understand how to, how to have a care and concern for others in that form of government, in that self-rule, so that therefore, like the, so that the rule of the people doesn't become corrupted, so that the rule of the people ends in the common happiness of all, and not to the rule of one majority over an, an oppressed either minority or majority. Anybody add anything to that? You're gonna get your chance. <laughs> Um, Grace, there's uh, unrest on college campuses. Why do you think that is, and does it have to do with the, excuse me, I can't keep my mask out of my mouth. Uh, does it have to do with uh, the, what they study in the colleges, do you think, as far as you know? Well, Dr. Arn, I've thought about this a lot, um, this summer especially because I was at home with friends who go to different sorts of colleges than Hillsdale, like big state universities. Um, and I found that oftentimes the passion, the, the overwhelming anger, fear, frustration that my peers are experiencing can come from a lack of perspective. Um, a lack of trust and a lack of a sense of the bigger picture that I do think my classical education has prepared me to look at history, look at man's failings with more hope and with more trust that with wisdom and with the practice of virtue, even if it comes in the smallest actions, that that's where change begins, with trust in history and trust in a balanced education. So I do think there is something to be said for classical education as a tempering influence on the passion of youth that seeks naturally to reform and to bring good into situations, which is a very good inclination, but can sometimes go awry, especially in large groups that are just bursting with emotion. Dr. R, may I jump in? Yes. It's, it's also worth pointing out perhaps that uh, commonplace in contemporary university, college and university education is that the purpose of that education is what is now called activism. 
That, that is, the unrest on the campuses in part answers to what the students have been told the very function and purpose of their education happens to be, uh, turning from um, thoughtless citizens perhaps to uh, something we, we call an activist. Now the object or goal, purpose, the end of the action is never clearly defined. Usually you get vague formulations like uh, uh, social uh, reformation, justice, or, or um, um, modification of the, of, the, uh, of the culture in some ill-defined way. Uh, this is in contrast to every prior understanding of post-secondary education as still fundamentally a place of learning. What one does depends upon what is, and we have to learn what things are before we can learn how to interact with them or respond to them. That kind of learning has been shoved aside in favor of a kind of hasty, urgent, even restless so-called activism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With a view to the good of the student, how do we understand the relationship between public education and the family? What do we think about that? Hmm. Dan, what do you think about that? Then I'll ask Mr. Whitey. Hmm. Yeah, well, I think um, uh, it, it's important to view, you know, parents as, as at the first and often the best educators. Um, and I think it's important that they're involved in the decisions um, that go into um, schooling for their own children. They know their children the best. They know what they need. Um, but they also have the most at stake. I mean, they're their kids, right? But that said, um, we as a society should do what we can to provide resources so that parents can be successful. Um, and one way to do that is to provide schooling. And I think that we should um, view schooling, teachers, um, as a resource to parents in trying to help them to do the things that maybe they're not well equipped to do, um, but all with the idea in mind that ultimately we are serving the family. And is that anything, Benjamin? Um, as someone who went to a public school myself, um, I would say that there is, there is great value in having public education. It's something that um, the way that our society runs today, it's, it's a necessity because not everyone can stay home and educate their children. Um, and with that in mind, I agree with what Dr. Copeland has said. Like, the, the, idea, the purpose of the school is to serve the family in creating and developing uh, individuals who are um, competent, responsible, tempered, um, but I think it also falls um, to the parents to develop those virtues in their own children, to supplement the education that the public, um, that the public school can give, because it can't do everything. How are parents uh, regarded in the charter schools, Dr. O'Toole? Well, um, I think that charter schools are particularly this is particularly prevalent in charter schools because by definition, if you are sending your child to a charter school, you are choosing that school for your child. And speaking as someone who's run one of these schools, that's a great, that's a great gift. It's a great gift to know that the children are there because their parents wanted them to be there. Uh, it's also, it also means something about the relationship between the parent and the school. It means that the parent has, has recognized that the parent has the responsibility of choosing something that will be good for the child, and that the school owes the parent accurate information about what is going to be taught at that school. I remember when we first started our school in Leander, it was, uh, you know, I got up there in front of a bunch of parents and I was giving a talk about the curriculum. And I said, my job is to explain to you what happens at this school so that you can decide if it's right for your children. And they had never, these particular parents had never received a talk of that type from a school administrator. They had always been held at arm's length by the school. 
uh, they were allowed to ask certain questions regarding health and safety, but no one had ever really taken the time to explain what books are their children going to learn. Uh, and so it, that began the process, project of sort of changing the culture among the parents and helping them learn that not only was it okay to ask questions, they ought to ask questions, and teaching them what kinds of questions they ought to be asking. And I think that in the end, they made, they made the school stronger because of it. Uh, it's, a, it's a good thing for the school when the parents are ready to hold the school accountable. Uh, what's Parents Weekend like here, David? <laughs> parents Weekend is a um, barely controlled two-day party <laughs> <laughs> where, where the parents, ostensibly here to inquire after the, the uh, welfare, not just health and welfare, uh, but the intellectual and academic welfare of their children actually enjoy talking to each other, meeting each other, and treat it as a kind of reunion that happens twice a year. Okay. So joking aside, uh, parents' weekends are common on campuses across the country, but they're usually uh, fairly tame events. Here, um, they're not out of control, but they are uh, occasions where the parents actually sit and meet and speak with the faculty that semester teaching uh, uh, the parents' sons and daughters. Um, it's not, uh, you might think, oh, so it's a continuation of high school uh, parent-teacher conferences. That would only be true superficially. The parents know that the students here are engaged in an extraordinary, and uh, it's an overused word, let me avoid cliches. The parents know that their, their sons and daughters are engaged in life-grounding intellectual and, and personal activities here, and they, they want to make sure that the, the faculty understand just how precious those sons and daughters are. I, I have to say that rather than saying, how, what are the grades and how are they doing, they, they mostly want to tell you about their sons and daughters. They want to look in your eye and see if you recognize that these young men and women are beautiful, precious beyond belief, and beloved. Um, maybe that sounds too romantic, but I, I after decades of experience here with Parents Weekend. That's really how I, no hyperbole, that's how I would characterize it. Uh, every year I have, uh, this year, I, this last semester, I just had two come up to me and say, parents come up to me and say, uh, this is too good for my kid. Can I come here? <laughs> <laughs> that happens in, in, that happens in class too. That is a lot of prospective students visit and sit in on classes, and their parents will accompany them quite often. And almost invariably, the parents say that very thing when they come up after class to thank you. They say, uh, I don't care about my kid. Can I take this class? But um, they're, they're joking, of course, but they, the, there is an interesting partnership um, uh, between the college parents and the students. It's not the kind of thing where you just drop your kid off and get out of our face, go away. We, we want the parents to be attentive. We have to, we require space in which to do our work. Of course, we can't be interfered with. But the parents aren't extraneous. They're part of this partnership as well. And um, it's not just that they appreciate it. They understand that what we're doing is continuing, as Dan suggests, we're continuing what they began. Yeah, I have a principle that I love to state and I thought it up one time reading something that Secretary DeVos published. Uh, the proper sovereign in education is the school because it's in the school where the students and the parents and the teachers, all of whom know each other, do the actual work that goes on in the school. And so things that are powerful, that are remote from the school, they, they can't have the information. And uh, that's, you know, like we're very famous around here. We don't, we don't take kindly to people telling us what to do. But the reason is, this is our problem, right? We are in contact with the enemy. I mean, the students, every day. <laughs> so so <laughs> what do they need? How do you help them? And, you know, we also can't forget, if you, you know, in these charter schools, I see it. I, I never saw it, understood it fully until I came to work here, but... Uh, Students do the learning, and it's hard for them. 
And if they're not focused on it, at every moment, they're not learning anything. So somehow this uh, idea of bottom-up government that's the American idea was especially good for education. And top-down is the rule in every area of policy now, and I think it's particularly disastrous in education. And I thank the Secretary for resisting that so effectively. Thanks, Dr. Arnn. Can I ask the students a question? Yeah, all you want. So I'm really curious, I'm really curious from the students, what drew you to Hillsdale College? And sort of as a precursor to that, was your experience through your K-12 years um, similar in preparation, or was it a, a good preparation for the type of uh, approach and study that you're doing at Hillsdale currently? Whoever wants to start. Okay, Benjamin, you're getting off easy. Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, uh, I came to Hillsdale um, because I visited twice, once, um, by myself and once uh, for the Scholars Weekend that they do here. Um, and I was blown away by the amount of community and the closeness of that community that exists here. Um, like it's a very small school. You, I see the same people every day. And that's something that I had at my, um, at my public high school. It was about 800 kids. Um, and I, I really liked that and the in addition to that community, it was also the faculty. Um, the faculty that we have here are amazing. And that's, that's no extension, um, no hyperbole. Um, and that was, that was really exciting to, to see that relative to the other schools that I had visited. Right. So was this sort of an extension of your experience in high school, certainly in terms of size, but uh, in, in, in terms of its approach to uh, learning and expectations and? Uh, in terms of size, yes. In terms of style, n not so much. Uh, I, went to a, I went to a very good public high school, but um, like I said, the community is totally different and the, um, a lot of the teachers did have a similar, uh, similar passion for teaching, passion for the students. Um, and they were, they, those teachers were the ones that actually pointed me to Hillsdale um, because they knew that I would like it uh, and they, they cared. Um, so, but the, the rigor, the academic rigor is something that I was unprepared for and happily challenged by. <laughs> first, the, uh, that first semester was a little challenging probably? Mm -hmm. It was a little bit of a culture shock, but it was a, <laughs> I've, I've come to enjoy it. The average high school GPA coming in here is 3.92 and the average freshman GPA is 2.85. We call that chart shock and awe. <laughs> I'm ready, I can go next. I went to private Catholic school in elementary and middle and high school. And even though they weren't classical schools, I found there that the fire was lit within me because the liturgical, sacramental um, context that I learned everything in very much taught the discipline and the love that made me seek out a classical liberal arts college. So I looked at all Catholic colleges and Hillsdale was the only college that I looked at that was not Catholic. But when I came and visited here, when I met the students, I came on Scholars Weekend too, and actually that's when I met Ben, and we've been friends ever since. When I came here and met the students, I realized that they would challenge me, and that I had nothing to fear from going to a college that wasn't expressly Catholic because the students here would be leading me towards the truth. So that's what's happened. I've come here and I've made friends of all denominations that have brought me closer to God. So that has been amazing. And it's true, the communities here 
are so strengthening and so unique. And I'm very sad to leave, but I know now I know the value of building a community like that. And I hope that wherever I go, I can bring that spirit with me. That's great. Thank you, Grace. Um, going to a Barney Charter School, I, a lot of my teachers were Hillsdale grads, um, but I would say I was having such a good time there that I really didn't spend a lot of time thinking about what I was supposed to do after graduation. Um, so sure enough, senior year rolls around and I find that I don't know what it means to go to college. Um, I was always a good student and so it kind of, and I wanted to keep studying so it seemed to make sense, like maybe keep studying, go to college. Um, but I did some college visits and I, I just felt like no one was really explaining to me what it meant to go to college. Um, I'm the oldest in my family. I didn't have very many friends or family members who were college students. Um, and I would go on these tours of colleges where they would point out all the great amenities, um, like here's our state-of-the-art sports facility, here are newly updated dorms, and that was great, but I kind of walked away thinking like, do you guys do class here? <laughs> um, but I, so I, I was in my senior year, had no idea what I was doing, and um, I kind of had a gang of teachers who really cared about me um, talk me into applying to Hillsdale, um, which for some reason I just never considered. Um, and they were like, hey, you, you say you like to study, um, you're really interested in a place where they're going to take text seriously and where professors are going to engage with you and care about you and the other students will care that much as well. Um, if you want the kind of experience that you've been enjoying here, maybe you should be going to Hillsdale. Somehow those two pieces didn't click together in my brain, um, but when people who cared about me were helping me see that, um, I kind of thought that that would be a good idea. Um, then there was a little bit more pressure involved from, <laughs> from other actors. <laughs> well, let's say I got involved at some point and that was pretty direct. <laughs> Jonah, you want to add something? Yeah, I mean, so for me, again, going to that same Barney Charter School, I think the things that I was learning, I, I recognized that they were, they were good for me, not just in terms of like, knowing them, but they were really good for my character and for my soul. And going to the founders for four years, just seeing how much it had my education and the community surrounding that education, everyone learning the same things um, that are of such value, reading the same great texts, having great conversations, seeing how that transformed me as a, as a person um, really just led me to, to really learn, long for, for more of that. And so I think going here for me was just the, the obvious next step in my journey to, to really grow as a person, to feed my soul in a sense. And so studying these, these things of such great importance, um, yeah, in, in community with some of the best teachers in the world, I think was really just what led me to do it, um, to come here to continue studying um, and in particular to, to st study uh, kind of politics and the philosophy of politics, that's you know, what I'm gonna major in. Um, reading those things makes you think about not just you know, a particular minute field of study, but about kind of the universal, um, the universal things that, that are really good for an education of anyone. It's in a sense, a, it's a universal education, and it's an education not unique to any kind of particular person, but an education that's good for everyone. And so studying, studying the things that, you know, wanted, that I thought were just really important to, to not only like know on a surface level, but to know deeply, such that they're ingrained in my soul, is just very important to me. And so that, that really led me to pursue Hillsdale and I'm really enjoying my time here so far, and I think it's doing a lot for me. Awesome, thanks, Jonah. Uh, Dr. Arm, could, could I ask you, what was the motivation for actually launching the Charter School Initiative? Uh, as a driver. Well, of course, lots and lots of people are very concerned about what's going on in education in the country, 
And a lot of those people would poke me in the chest and say, you have to do something about K through 12 education. You know, and uh, the first person who did that was Milton Friedman, the great economist. Uh, and then uh, somebody you probably knew, John Walton of the Walton family, who was killed in a plane crash two months after I sent him a letter and told him what I thought I could do. And what could we do? You know, first of all, we're not a campaign organization for school reform. We don't course initiatives. So if we know anything, we know how to teach. And so the great barrier, and I said we should help schools get better. We're supposed to know how to do that. And uh, the great barrier was colleges start charter schools often and they get some revenue from it. And we don't take that money, so we don't get that. And, uh, but then, then I got to thinking more. We couldn't really even own a charter school. Uh, so we, uh, I started talking to people and uh, people I know that I respect. And I'd say, why don't you start a charter school? We'll help you. And then sure enough, citizens, you know, there are 25 of them. They're going to be, we don't know how many, but there's three or four a year is the way it's running. Uh, and those are chances for self-government for, for the people who form those schools. And they don't any of them get paid for it. And we don't make any money from it. And the school is funded by usually about 75% of what the public schools get. And in most cases, that's plenty. You can do it with that. So yeah, that was the idea. And uh, I got partial to it. And then Dan Copeland down there and uh, David Whalen there has taught me a lot of what I know about education. But uh, you know, what could we contribute? And if we can contribute something, it's knowledge of the fundamentals of education, mm -hmm. things that are abiding in education, whatever else is going on in the economy, in the world. Uh, every kid is a human being. They need to find out what they need to know to live a good life. And those take attributes of character and intellect. And so education from Plato's Academy to today has always been concerned chiefly with those things. So we try to bring that focus. Yeah, that's how it got started. And Steve Barney is a, it's called the Barney Charter School. That's because Steve Barney, uh, he's, he's got a great, he's a trustee of the college now. He has a great gift. He gets emotional and cries about things. He's a big blubber baby. <laughs> and uh, we were at his house in Florida, and he was especially bad about poking me in the chest. He said, do you know, two blocks from here, there's a school full of poor kids, and they're not learning anything. The numbers are, you have to do something about that. And I said to, say, I said to him, you know, I thought of something. And the next thing you know, we got the Barney Project. Mm. That's how I got going. Mm. Um, and um, there's nobody waiting to get into these schools. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I think their last numbers. What are the numbers, Katie? Uh, last counting, there's 6,000 people waiting to get on the waiting to get into these schools. But the number is, in fact, much higher than that, and changing all the time. It's very common for these schools to open up and not to have enough seats for all of the people who want to go. And the schools are difficult too, by the way. You, you know, you, there's an honor code. You got to. Everybody learns Latin in these schools, and they flock to it. Yeah, and if I may, there's, there's something, I, I, there's something beautiful about that, and there's something unexpected about that. You know, sometimes when people hear Natasha and Jonah and Grace and Ben speak, they think classical education is for the really academic kids you know, for the kids who just love school and have the high test scores. But these charter schools are just for everyone. And all of the kids come and they all learn Latin. And unless there's a rare reason why they cannot, such as a learning disability or something, they all learn to translate Latin by the time they're in ninth grade. They read the Iliad, they read Shakespeare. They give a senior thesis before they graduate, every single last one of them. And so I think that shows that Classical education is American education. It's not, it's not one select method of doing it. It's the way of doing it that, that our country needs and uh, in many places used to have. Kids today learn that Thomas Jefferson was author of the Declaration of Independence and he was a slaveholder. Uh, 
What they don't learn is he was deeply troubled about that all his life and wrote beautiful things about the wrong of it. And he is the prime reason there's never been slavery in the Northwest Territory, which includes Michigan, because the land came as a gift from Virginia to the Union. Thomas Jefferson was the mover of that. He insisted that there be a clause, and it's there in the Northwest Ordinance, that there will never be slavery here. Now, if kids learn all of that, it produces something in them. It produces more respect for Thomas Jefferson while admitting the fault. But in addition, it teaches them to look at the past and see things are never perfect. Maybe they can be great, but they're not perfect. And, and, and we can't look back on the past smugly and say, we're so much better than they are. It gives a motive to work and to learn and to try then to read, lead a, lit, a rich and excellent life, which is hard to do. David, I have a question. Is it all right? I have a question for you, and then we're going to have to stop. Uh, how do you decide what should be in a curriculum in a college or a school? Well, first you assemble a committee. <laughs> okay, see, now the, the fact that there was laughter is an index of just how poisonously wrong that answer is. Um, the, um, uh, in a way, Dr. Copeland uh, touched on the central point in, in his earlier remarks. Uh, a curriculum is not a political compromise of competing interests. I should say, ideally, properly, a curriculum is not a, um, um, a, a compromise of competing interests. Rather, it's an answer to the question, what does every educated man and woman need to know about things that are universally important? And, and what, what Dan said is that the rich tradition of learning uh, that we've all inherited, we often throw away our inheritance, but we've all inherited a, a, uh, at least the, the access to a rich tradition of learning about what kinds of things promote wisdom, what kinds of things are conducive to virtue, what kinds of threats and dangers and obstacles are there to uh, our, our intellectual apprehension, our moral uh, correction. It's, it's uh, there's a wealth of, of um, uh, good and bad to learn about in the world, and the literary, cultural, historical, political tradition uh, that we've all been born into can teach us a lot about that. And so you have recourse to that tradition in pursuit of the answer to the question I asked just a moment ago, what does every educated man or woman need to know? And, and what that usually turns into is uh, a set of principles. They don't you, you don't need to learn everything about physics or history. You don't need to cram your mind with min endless uh, 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 streams of minutiae. What you really need, you need lots of information. You do have to ground everything that you learn in, in um, um, truths, facts, things that, that you can really wrap your mind around. But what you're aiming for are principles, principles that apply even to the things you haven't learned yet. So maybe that's too vague or abstract an answer, but I guess in brief I would say a curriculum is not just a heaping together of whatever you have at hand. And I'm afraid that's what it all too often is. Maybe my view is too jaundiced. But instead a curriculum looks at the bodies of learning available to us, especially those time tested and inherited and discerns in that body of learning what it is that we need to pass on to the next generation that can help them lead the kind of life you just described. You add anything, Secretary? No, I think uh, that was a, a really thoughtful and um, deep explanation for what is a very complex topic and uh, one that has lots and lots of opinions surrounding it, but I think you, I think you really articulated it well. Thank you. I think that's also a good place to stop, and it's time to stop. And so we'll see most of you at dinner, I think. Thank you, Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos. Thank you.